I think Robert should do this talk next year. Doesn't he look like Blessed Stanley? <laughs> yeah. So let's pray. O oh Lord our God, you are worthy to receive all glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they came to be and were made. And when man by disobedience had lost your friendship, you came in mercy to the aid of all, so that those you seek might find you. Seek us, O oh Father. Seek and find within us the image of your Son, that we may be found in him on the dread day of judgment, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Late in the night of July 27th, 1981, or perhaps in the wee hours of the morning of July 28th, three armed men broke into the priest's house in the village of Santiago Atitlan, Guatemala. Not finding the man they were looking for, they did manage to capture a teenage boy named Francisco, who was the assistant priest's younger brother and the live-in parish janitor. Show us where the parish priest is hiding, they told the terrified young man. And threatened with death, he did as he was told. He showed them the room where the parish priest was hiding, knocked on the door and said, Padre, they're here for you. The parish priest was by this time wide awake and probably looked wistfully at the window out of which he'd planned to escape. He'd been expecting this, that his name was on a death list. He'd been urged to flee the parish, but had responded stoutly, I have a commitment to the people and I will not leave. He'd begun sleeping in a different room every night and had provided himself an escape route anticipating this event. What he had not anticipated, however, is that Francisco would be captured. This changed everything. He knew how these men operated. If they began to suspect that Francisco was deceiving them in order to save his pastor's life, they would kill him. So the priest had a choice, to escape out the window and let them kill the boy, or to open the door and betray himself into their hands to save the young man who had brought his enemies down upon his head and he opened the door. Francisco told us what happened next, though he's making conjectures because he ran for cover immediately. The three men tried to take the parish priest alive, but he refused to be taken. Sure to be facing horrific torture, which he knew about because he'd seen the bodies of some of his parishioners that they left on the roadside, he didn't know how well he'd stand up to the knife. He might betray confidences. He might break the seal of confession. And so he cried out in a loud voice, kill me here. And then, dressed in his pajamas and using only his bare hands, he fought three fully armed soldiers to a standstill for long enough that, for fear of alarming the whole village, the soldiers terminated the encounter by shooting him in the face. You've guessed the name of the parish priest, I'm guessing described by his friends as a very ordinary person, Stanley Francis Rother. In September 27th, Stanley was named Beatus by the Holy Father in Rome in recognition of his martyrdom. This is his story. It's a shocking, upsetting story, and it gets more upsetting the more you read about it. So why tell it? Didn't it end in the worst possible way? If we're Christians and take seriously the words of the books of the New Testament, we must say, no, it did not. Because Stanley achieved great holiness. That is to say, he resembled in a striking and awe-inspiring way the Savior himself who laid down his life for his sheep. We believe that those who walk after the footsteps of Christ in this life will walk beside him in the gardens of paradise. Holiness is simply living the life of the church, Christ's life, because the church is his body. As Blessed Marmion teaches, all the events of Christ's life belong to us and indeed are reproduced in our own lives because our lives on earth are the same life that Christ lived on this earth and lives at the right hand of the Father. 
we should be able to recognize then in our own Christian journeys a reflection or interpretation of the life of Christ according to the circumstances in which providence has placed us. And so, we can say that Stanley's life is one long story of no greater love. God called Stanley, a very ordinary person, to leave his life as a farmer and become a priest, to leave his life as an American and become a foreign missionary, and to leave his very life, which he lived no longer for himself, but for him who died and rose for us. And this is not unique at all. Each of us is called to be a part of God's grand plan for healing and restoration of the universe, even though we too are very ordinary men. And there are ways this will happen that will amaze us if we open and lift up our hearts. The story of Father Stanley's, one more, sorry. That's for the extended version. One more, please, sorry. The story of Father Stanley's life begins in Okarchi, Oklahoma, where he, there you go, where he was the son of a second generation German immigrant. His family was devout and as the eldest son he looked forward to becoming the Mr. Rother who owned and operated the family farm. Some of you might be in similar situations. He was never much of a book learner probably because he focused on learning the trades necessary to be a successful farmer. He was famously handy, he could fix anything, and he had an indomitable work ethic. He also had a fun side. His brother tells a story of him learning to swim. He was asked by a reporter, what's it like to be related to a saint? And he said, I can't pray to him, he threw me in the pond. One day Stan decided brother needed to learn how to swim and just chucked him in the pond. Of course, he was never in any real danger, but he didn't enjoy the situation at all. Stanley's life plans changed, however, when he discerned a vocation to the priesthood. He entered seminary where he struggled academically in part because of his lackluster high school education, but also because he was taken advantage of for free labor by the seminary not this seminary. He effectively functioned as their maintenance man, not knowing how to say no. But when his marks weren't up to snuff, he was informed that he'd failed, that he had no vocation, and that he'd best go home. You can imagine what this felt like. His roommate found him looking sad and asked him what was wrong, and he told him. Stan said his roommate, I see the way you pray. You have a vocation. Let's call your bishop and get this sorted out. So they called Collect. Anyone know what Collect calls are? Great. To the bishop's residence in Oklahoma, and the bishop said, OK, Stan, pack your bags and head on back. I have a plan. By the time Stanley had driven back to Oklahoma from Texas, He'd been accepted for the following fall semester at Mount St. Mary's Seminary, whose rector, Monsignor Mulcahy, who this building's named after, was a friend of the bishops. He worked on the farm for the spring and the summer, then arrived at the mount where he was a success because of the fraternity that Deacon Bossy just told you about, and because of Monsignor Mulcahy, who tutored him personally and mentored him, and taught him how to read Latin and how to say no in English. He was ordained priest in 1963. Father Stanley served in several parishes, but was actually looked down on by the clergy of his diocese precisely because he could work with his hands. This was something priests did not do, in their opinion. But not everyone had this opinion of him. Father Tom Stafford, the pastor of the diocesan mission parish in Guatemala, that's another whole story why they had one, but they did, recognized in Stanley everything needed in a successful missionary. And so over lunch, he asked Stanley if he'd come with him to Guatemala. This meant leaving behind everything he knew, going 2,000 miles away in a time before Skype or FaceTime or Zoom, to serve people he'd never met, and to speak a language he couldn't even spell, let alone speak or understand. 
And of course, he said yes. And so in the fall of 1968, he and Father Stafford drove to Guatemala from Oklahoma, 2,000 miles in a white pickup truck, towing a 1,000-pound piece of farm equipment that was a donation to his new parish. But he couldn't have been prepared for what he found there. The people were Mayan Indians and spoke a language unique to their own mountain valley called Zutujil. Can we say that? Zutujil. That's not bad. There was no Rosetta Stone and no textbook. He had to pick it up by ear. But this man who couldn't learn Latin and who never mastered Spanish learned this language fluently. The people lived in unspeakable poverty. The infant mortality rate was 33%, so there's a one-third chance that this little guy made it. Almost everyone was dramatically malnourished, and almost everyone lived in wooden huts with indoor cooking fires, and if anyone knows anything about the way soot contributes to tuberculosis, you'll understand why a lot of them died of TB. These were the people he found, and these were the people he loved. You go to the next one that has the, the view of the lake. Um, where he lived was marvelously beautiful. Uh, you maybe get a chance to go there during your seminary time. After masses on Sunday, he always ate at somebody's house and ate whatever he was given, even when it made him sick, which it often did. Hopefully the cooking crew hasn't made you sick. He drove his motorcycle to parts of the parish to visit people who couldn't make it to Mass because it was a huge area and there were no roads. He taught them, visited them, and gave them the sacraments. He sat for hours in the rectory, up to 10 or 12 hours at a time, adjudicating disputes, mending marriages, resolving arguments, and even pulling teeth. As a missionary priest, he had to have rudimentary medical and dental skills. With help, he operated a catechetical radio station in Zutu Hill, ran a medical clinic, taught the people better farming techniques, commissioned a translation of the New Testament books into the native language, and organized a corps of catechists to teach people their faith and to teach them to read. With all of this, you'd expect him to be beloved, but he was not. The government of Guatemala at the time was a right-wing junta facing a communist insurgency. The next slide, if you don't mind. Neither the government nor the communists had any love for the Indians or for the church. The government preferred the Indians to be ignorant, superstitious, and dependent on handouts, where the church preferred them to be educated, faithful, and free. Stanley's quiet work among the Zutu Hill, the one before that, Sorry. Simply the practical working out of Catholic social teaching ran directly against government policy. And when one news reporter asked him why he was so obstinately political, Stanley responded by saying, to shake the hand of an Indian is a political act. And by that he meant that the government had made something that was fundamental part of Christian teaching a political issue. That doesn't mean you stop doing it, right? Sometimes people make political things that aren't political, but we have to do them anyway. Society always has reasons to hate the church. They change with every age, but they're always there. In this case, it was simple. The government wanted the people to be afraid. Stanley told them that as Christians, they needed fear no one, and fearlessly fulfilled his priestly ministry in spite of danger. And so the government was afraid of him, not he of them, and so he had to die. Told of his impending assassination, he went into hiding for a couple weeks while arranging an escape back to Oklahoma. It's clear that he was hiding rather than running away because his departure delay was occasioned by his insistence on obtaining advance permission to come back to Guatemala. This is very important. This storm will blow over is probably what he was thinking. And Archbishop Flynn, one of his close friends and the uh, rector of this seminary, was under the impression at least that his bishop had put him under obedience to flee the country if his life was in danger. While he was in hiding, 
he was discovered by a group of soldiers and led them on a wild car chase through Guatemala City like a Jason Bourne movie. Uh, and if Hollywood ever makes a film about Blessed Stanley, everyone will say, oh, Hollywood made that part up, but now you know that it actually happened. You're welcome. Um, home in the States, Stanley was inconsolable at the thought of his people being without a priest. The people he knew very well were facing aggression from the state and pressure from guerrilla groups affiliated with the communists. His brother describes him sitting in the family home staring disconsolately out the window with a blank expression on his face. He was in safety while they were in danger, sheep without their shepherd, and it was tearing him apart. He went to his bishop and asked for permission to return. The storm had not blown over. He knew very well that an angry American parishioner had written a letter to the Guatemalan consulate and accused him of advocating the overthrow of the government, which of course was false. But this letter was still a death warrant if he ever set foot in Guatemala again. This did not faze him at all. He needed to be with his people. It was that simple. His archbishop granted him permission to return, never expecting to see him again. He arrived at Santiago and during Holy Week. Excuse me. 1981, and was assassinated in July, the month of the precious blood that same year. Monsignor Baker likes to share that, you may have heard this already, that he'd been scheduled to drive to Guatemala City to a health clinic to donate blood the next day for a parishioner, and he didn't make the appointment because he'd already given his blood. Those interested in learning more about Father Stanley should consider getting the biography by Scapper Landa called The Shepherd Who Didn't Run, or viewing our very own uh, Father Charles P. Connor in his documentary from EWTN. Um, that's how he talks. You'll get to meet him. He's awesome. I'd like to conclude with a, bl a brief reflection. When my father, who's an atheist, first visited the seminary, I told him the story of Stanley while we were standing at that fountain over there, outside Icy Chapel. I then said to him, full of new seminarian zeal, Dad, the rector says we ought to be just like Father Stanley. My dad turned as white as your Prethi shirts, because he understood exactly what that meant. And then, somehow, words that I didn't think came out of my mouth, and I said, Dad, Jesus is worth dying for. We find ourselves in seminary, all of us, in a very strange year with the question before us, how are we going to grow to become like Blessed Stanley Rother? How are we going to be prepared to take a bullet rather than betray the commands of our Savior? How are we going to be prepared to leave everything familiar behind us and enter a whole new life of endless self-giving after the image of Christ? And the answer is, start with the little things. Obey the rule of life, including the COVID requirements. And if some of the requirements seem irrational to you, engage in what could be called the Christian two-step. From my perspective, this doesn't make sense. But what about from someone else's point of view? I wonder if any of us have ever felt unsafe where we live, and I doubt it. But that's not true of everyone who lives on that side of campus. Okay, So if us wearing masks outside, for example, makes other people feel safe where they live, that's part of being a man for others. Don't grumble even to yourself. Express concerns up the chain, like Deacon Bossy said, not sideways or downstream. Try to smile with your eyes. Do extra acts of kindness. Encourage one another more often than you normally would. Don't give way to discouragement. In doing these things, we're becoming like Stanley and learning how to give our lives away in love, one moment at a time, one small step at a time, out of self-absorption into freedom.
uniting each to the pure and holy sacrifice of the altar. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen.